Good morning, everyone. Guys, the situation in Ukraine is going bad from worse. Very, the escalations are unbelievable right now. We've got Vladimir Putin threatening to take out decision making centers in Kiev. We've got the use of nuclear weapons. Now, it be, you know, the use of nuclear weapons, it's just like right now, guys. The rhetoric, it seems like the use is going to be an inevitability at some point. Now, initially, I said the main location that I, the main risk here is in the Kursk region. If the Ukrainians get nuclear weapons off the United States, which I've done videos about before, that could be a potential that the Ukrainians use that on their own ground as well. Guys, we're escalating into a place right now where we can't go back. We're going to be talking about all of this. We're going to be talking about the recent strikes on Ukraine. My friend sent me and um, he video called me last night as the... Um, uh, I, I, I don't want to say what they were because I, I genuinely don't know, but they were, it, it, they appeared to be these um, Shahid drones. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell from the, you know, I couldn't tell from the, um, from the video he was sharing with me. You know, guys, we have got a, a, deter a massively deteriorating situation. Over a million people left without power in Ukraine. And how does that affect us in the United Kingdom? Well, guess what, sweet cheeks, best pucker up. Because we in the United Kingdom are net energy importers. So if all the if the Europeans are having to bolster the Ukrainian power grid, guess what? This winter, if it goes cold, we're not going to have enough power. Any, uh, we're not going to have enough power for ourselves because most of our energy comes from France. Guys, the situation is really getting out of control. So let's just get into it then, guys. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to share the, where are we? I'm going to share the map with you guys, as I always do in the morning or my first video of the day, because it's really important that you guys understand how much ground is being lost every day in Ukraine. So if I, right, I've not updated this. Right, let's just go backwards. Let's, we'll go backwards and then we'll go forwards. We'll, 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 we'll be like a seesaw. 28, 27, there we are. Right, guys, situation from the 27th. So as I said, I, the uh, the Russians are going to make their way up this river. They're probably going to get to, the, there's a little, there's a group of little reservoirs here, and then they're probably going to make their way north to Pokrovs and then circle it. So let's just quickly, guys, you know, go through this. So every day, Every day, guys, more and more. I mean, look at the amount of ground that's been taken. And when people are talking about the front line in Ukraine, people are talking about, oh, if the front line collapses, if the front line collapses. Guys, what do we think? Do we think it's already collapsed? Just look at the amount of ground the Russians are taking on a daily basis. It's phenomenal. So anyway, guys, so the Russia, uh, well, Vladimir Putin himself has been threatening decision making centers with his new, his new multi entry, re entry vehicle, whatever that's, um, whatever, whatever it's called. Um, basically, the missile system that the Russians used on um, on Dnipro. This is a new type of system. Now, the the significance of this system is it really can't be stopped. <clears throat> There's no air defences for this. Now, these systems can be nuclear tipped, but the argument for nuclear the the argument for the use of nuclear weapons right now, I don't see the. Um, if you were doing a business, you wouldn't see any business case for this. Um, there isn't no use case uh, value for using a nuclear weapon right now. And I get it. People want to talk about this. You know, people want to talk about it on the news. They want to say, "Oh, Putin could." Putin could strike Manchester, Birmingham and London. Yes, but like, why? Why would you do that? Realistically, the United Kingdom is about to tear itself apart anyway. So why would you why would you do that and galvanize the United Kingdom into a into a solid striking force? You wouldn't do that. <clears throat> Likewise, if you struck any of the major cities in and around Europe, you would bring Europe together with with one voice and then they'd go to war with Putin. And Putin doesn't want that. Now, when where do we go with this guys where do we go i was going to do this later on in the video but we'll do it now so the use case for nuclear weapons there really isn't one at the moment on the battlefield like where is putin gonna like where is he going to use a nuclear weapon because don't forget the first time a nuclear weapon's used 
the, the other the, whoever is whoever uses it first the other side will be galvanized and will be united they will be you know they'll come together so kind of nobody wants to use one just yet and i'm not i'm certainly not saying they're not going to be used i'm saying i myself don't see a don't see a strategic benefit from using one so is he going to take out an airfield with one of these, um, you know, these, these these long range with a nuclear weapon? Well, he could, but again, why when he can take an airfield out conventionally? Why are you going to do that? Not only if you take an airfield out with the nuclear weapon, you're contaminating that whole region, you're contaminating... <clears throat> There's going to be nuclear fallout that could potentially hit your own troops. And where I will accept that the Russians, I, I won't accept, I don't accept that the Russians don't care about their own soldiers. What I do accept is the Russians have a bigger, you know, they have a greater um, risk appetite for their own soldiers. So, you know, where I get the Russians have a bigger ri risk appetite for their own soldiers, I, I don't see where they would like actively contaminate their own soldiers because that's going to be bad for russia in itself so they kind of you know they want to keep them functioning because they want them to continue the job and if you know they're all contaminated and not and expired then they're not going to do their job and again we have got the russian i think it's the russian defense minister in north korea for discussions which kind of remember when i said that my friend sent me unconfirmed reports that there's a hundred thousand troops in north korea getting ready well guess what i think this could be the beginning of it so i don't see the use of nuclear weapons but these hypersonic missiles which is kind of well i'll come on to it actually guys what the um what these are because i found a really good article that explains what the um Orshnik is and how it works because not all missiles are the same Norm normally in normal conventional missiles so your high mars your um your scalp they're launched from a ground-based launch vehicle and you know essentially your scalp is launched from a ground-based launch system because at some point that is in the ground right you know the, the aircraft that that goes on flies and then it's launched so the aircraft that the um that the scalp and the taurus and the storm shadow are underneath essentially that is you know that is earth-based these new systems these literally go up into space and then they come down and there really isn't any stopping them because of the trajectory so let's just go on to that real quick guys and we'll talk about that and i'll put these links in the description so enter orsnik so November 21st, a new kind of missile carrying six warheads struck Dnipro. So we, we've all, in fact, let's just watch this a second, guys, because this is like, this is terrifying. Can you imagine that? That I mean, the, the video I've seen is the, is the wider view with the little logo here. I'm sure you guys have seen it as well. I shared it on, um, I did, I shared it on the video, couple, on a video a couple of, uh, well, on the 21st. But the whole sky opens up and this is just terrifying it's the fact that this can't be stopped so working backwards then guys this is what you've got this m i r v so this is a multi uh, multi independent um reentry vehicle Working backwards from the impact in Dnipro, six warheads fell to earth after they were dropped by separate targets on sorry at separate targets by a component of the missile called the MIRV, uh, mul multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle bus. So this thing here, guys, this is what goes into space. It can go into orbit and then it drops these things down. So six different warheads can be targeted at six different locations. Now, what you would find is these things can be, you know, and were designed to be nuclear tipped. So that's how you would fire a nuclear weapon. You would send this thing up into space and you would put these things down you know and they come down at a colossal speed and there really isn't any stopping them the russians have just shown that they can will and you know will probably use again this system so just before releasing the warheads the mirv orientates itself with onboard guidance system so it can direct each of them towards specific objects so while this thing's in space, guys, it's absolutely, absolutely insane. So look, guys, outer space, hundreds of kilometers above sea level. So this thing really is in space. 
This is a whole new dimension now, guys, to warfare. This thing will have a camera at the top of it. Um, and uh, just if you're interested, guys, you know, this thing finds stars and it orientates itself by stars. It's got a camera on it and it will orientate itself to stars. And then it will launch each one of these launch vehicles, guys. This will be traveling at a phenomenal speed. And these things, you know, th these things come down, they'll spin to get themselves um, stability. And then they, they, they come in and they strike the target. There really isn't anything that can stop it because this thing will just look like a satellite. And then by the time that these hit the ground, there really isn't any time to um, react. MARV consists uh coast through space towards the target area it is a stage of the missile that's most vulnerable to mid-course interception so at this point if we can identify this thing and i'm not 100 percent sure we can but then you have to send um, it says it's vulnerable to you know interception it's not really vulnerable guys like the amount of like the ukrainians certainly don't have the capacity to send a missile up into space and if you start sending missiles up into space to take these things out and cause explosions you could have the kessler syndrome which by you would this thing would obviously fragment say you send uh, i don't know an f-16 had a I don't know, into space satellite missile on it. And you managed to lock onto this and the missile went up and, you know, and you man and you could, you know, you did have the capacity to do that. Once this explodes, you're sending shrapnel everywhere. That shrapnel could then hit other satellites. Those other satellites could come off course, could hit other satellites and you have a knock on effect and you could just make space just finish guys. And you would see all communications go down. Um, so this is going backwards then guys, from the point of, um, the point of launch, the MIRV, uh, separates from the upper stage and after a brief acceleration will fly on a ballistic trajectory in space towards its objective. I would suspect that there are already these things in space. I would suspect that there are these things that fly over us all the time, you know, that have things in them that could fall down out of the sky. There was a news article a while ago about space nukes. Straight away, I said, you know, I did a video on that. I said, I don't think space nukes are a real thing because if you understand how nuclear weapons work, they have, you know, they have things inside them that decay over time. They, lo they lose their potency. And then what do you have? You have a load of nuclear waste in space. I said, you know, I don't see that as a credible threat. I think the real threat is ground-based space lasers taking out, um, you know, being able to take out the satellites that are going overhead. I don't see any nuclear weapons in space, but you can have kinetic impactors, which um, is what hit the Dnipro. Uh, the missiles first hit, so and then so what we what, I don't know how far yeah so it goes up like a normal rocket guys like like something that they were going to space um, you get stage one set uh, stage one separation or first stage separation second stage would be in there that would put it into its orbit that would separate and then you literally have this thing just orbiting the Earth and that can then come down as and when it decides now the terrifying thing about this guys. Because it's not a an intercontinental ballistic missile, because it's not one of these intercontinental ballistic systems, it has a different launch signature. Now, because it has a different, like I, what I mean by launch signature, the rocket looks different when it's launching. Because of that, we we know that the United States, that NATO understand, we're talking about the United States here, guys. Uh, the United States will know that there is no threat of that coming over to the United States. So that is a low risk for the United States. So I would suspect that Putin developed this as to not as not to rattle the cage of the United States because he can launch as many of these as he wants. And as long as they see that the same launch signature because they operate on known physics, because they operate on, you know, because because of that, the United States, they know, they understand that this thing is not coming over to the United States. So they can be safe. The United States are not going to send out any interceptor missiles because they know it's not coming towards them. So that's kind of, you know, what we're talking about now guys the new phase of this warfare now we've had a speech yesterday from vladimir putin and he came out and he said they're going to target the decision making centers in kiev 
And right now, he's shown that he can take out these, you know, he with devastating accuracy with the, you know, the kinetic impactors. They don't need to put a nuclear charge on this. So kind of when you go back and you say like, you know, oh, Russia's going to use, Russia's going to use nuclear weapons. I, you know, right now, I, I don't see the strategic benefit of doing this. I see the political gain if you use the, a low yield tactical nuclear weapon in the Kursk region. I, you know, that I still think that's the highest likelihood. But to use nuclear weapons on the battlefield at the moment, there isn't really any advantage. When I was in the military and I was doing my military training, there was a lot of um, NBC training, which was it's changed to CBRN now. Um, it was called nuclear, biological and chemical warfare training. So what, what you used to have to do, you have to put like your protective suits on and you just have to like run around doing like infantry attacks and stuff. So I think in the doctrine or the the way that the Western militaries used to think about using nuclear weapons would be, the West or Russia or whoever would use a nuclear weapon and then we'd have to get in our contamination suits and go and run and fight. It was, I mean, it's absolutely carnage trying to fight in one of those suits, guys. It's horrific. You can't breathe. You can't see your respirator. Um, um, what do you call it? Lenses. Your respirator lenses steam up. It's really hard going, guys, and you're not really combat effective in those suits. But last case, last ditch attempt, you know, you've got to do something. So that's kind of the, the situation in Ukraine. In fact, um, there was a huge attack last night in Kiev. Um, let me share this article with you. There was a huge attack last night in Kiev. A lot of drones went over. I don't know what kind they were. Um, <laughs> how is Russia avoiding detect? detection with its strikes from the skies above Ukraine. From different directions, I watched anti-aircraft batteries tracking and following Russian drones swarming over Kiev in unprecedented numbers. So this is from um, this is from yesterday, but last night there was a big attack as well. There's a veneer of normality to life in Ukraine's major cities. If you ignore the air raid sirens and booming sounds of anti-aircraft fire, the threatening buzz of drones passing overhead and the darkened streets of neighborhoods taking their turn as part of the rolling power cutouts affecting all of Ukraine. Guys, can you imagine if you lived there right now? Can you imagine if you was in Kiev with your family and, you know, you hear these drones come over, you hear these, uh, you know, you hear the, um, the air raid sirens, you know, and you're there with your family. Can you imagine the terror? Not only are you hearing drones come over, you're hearing the anti-aircraft, um, the missile defences going up to intercept it. You're hearing, you know, um, machine gun fire from the rooftops as people are trying to take these drones down with small arms fire. Can you imagine the terror that these people are living under? And then you've got rolling power cuts because the city is struggling. You've got rolling power cuts because, you know, the, the Russians are targeting the Ukrainians' energy system. Guys, we really are already, I believe, in a, in, a, in, a, in a stage of world war. But that's, you know, so the that's the situation from Ukraine at the moment, guys. We've also got the situation uh, where the Russian defense, um, the Russian defense minister is in North Korea for talks. Now, we don't really know what these talks are for, but I would suspect from what I've heard, and I've done other videos about this, I would suspect they're going to get a lot more manpower from North Korea. Now, how quickly this will be deployed, how quickly this will be managed to get onto the front line, we don't know. But what we can guarantee is that he's not in hes not in North Korea for tea and biscuits. You know, he will be there and he will want something and he will be giving the North Korean something. So, guys, the situation right now is just get going from bad to worse. When I talk about boots on the ground as an inevitability, I don't see any other way that we that the West can't do this. Remember that what 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 the delay is at the moment is the the time that it's take the time that it is taking for these anti personnel landmines to get pushed to the front. The Russians are taking a phenomenal amount of ground every day. There really is only one more one solution to this, guys. We need boots on the ground. You know the Ukrainians need boots on the ground. They're exhausted. They don't have any more. They don't have any more soldiers. And this guy, uh, is it Chris Kellogg? Keith Kellogg. I did, a vi I did a video about this guy, Keith Kellogg, yesterday. I told you his background. I told you um, 
what he represents in the military industrial complex and i told you what that meant for ukraine and how it looks like that you there will be no us troop boots on the ground but private companies are fair game now he came out and he said that he would give you his solution would be to tell them both to go to the um to tell the russians and the ukrainians to go to the negotiating table um if they don't go to the nego nego if putin doesn't go to the negotiating table he will give ukraine more weapons and if ukraine doesn't go to the negotiating table then um he will give um he will they will stop the flow of weapons into ukraine what if both what if neither side wants to go to the negotiating table like if you're a ukrainian now and you're losing ground day on day on day and you're losing people day on day on day like where, where's the negotiation for you it's not a negotiation it's you know it's a surrender deal and if you're if you're the russians and you're pushing and taking more ground every day like i show you guys every day you know why is putin going to come to any negotiating table because he's getting what he wants so then what are they going to do give more weapons to ukraine and also take more weapons away from ukraine Give him more weapons right now, guys. It doesn't really matter because it's not the weapons. Who's who's going to use them? If if the Ukrainians don't have the you know the the human beings there to go and operate these systems, it, it doesn't matter if there's a stockpile of a billion, uh, you know, long range, fancy dancy, all swinging, all dancing missile systems. It doesn't matter if there's nobody there to use them. And that's kind of the situation right now, guys. You know, you've seen from the map that the front line. Well, there isn't a front line. I feel, you know, when I said boots on the ground by 31st of December, I kind of said it and I was in a rush because you guys were pushing me. I was on a live stream. You guys were saying, come on, Sean, what do you think? What do you think? And I'd not really given any thought about it. But, you know, the more I think about it, the more I'm, you know, I'm more, the more I think, yeah, the 31st of December, you know, could be a reality. The way things are going at the moment, every kilometer that the, that the Russians push, west sorry from from the east to the west in ukraine that's another kilometer closer than they are to poland every kilometer that they push closer to poland is a you know is a kilometer closer to you know to nato to this you know this eastern wall now i mentioned nato i've also mentioned in lots of videos that nato is over it's obsolete it's not finished in fact i've got it up here guys let me just um talk through why nato is obsolete where are we where are we where are we where are we uh invocation right, here we are there we are right let me get this up for you guys and i'll just show you right now uh, i know i've done this a few times but i want to show in i i think i've done this a few times on the live stream i'm not sure if i've done this on um a video before so here's from the NATO website, guys, you know, and this is what um, this is the actual NATO website, uh, NATO dot um, and I'll put this link in the description. So this is what everyone talks about. OK, NATO Article 5. All right. It gives you no protection, absolutely zero protection. So for all those, those NATO bros who are saying, yeah, if Putin attacks us, right? Yeah. If Putin sends one missile and hits us, yeah. The whole of NATO is gonna gonna destroy Russia. Just tell. Okay, I'm gonna explain to you guys now what NATO Article Five. Said. I'll read it off the you know off the actual website, and we'll and just somebody put in the comments how that is any degree of security. Remember when this was written? When the you know when when NATO came into force. There was no such thing as drones. The use of long range hypersonic missiles had never even been contemplated. Weapons have advanced and evolved to such a state now that it makes Article 5 of the uh, NATO memorandum uh, irrelevant. So, should we go through it all? Uh, I will go through it all, guys. Um, Right, guys, we'll go down. Right, okay, and we'll go. We'll do. I'll, I'll just pick bits off it. I'll pick the important bits because I, I know I'm uh, running to the end of this video. So parties agree that an armed attack against one or more of them in Europe or North uh, America shall be considered an attack against them all. So that's pretty much where people leave it there. You know, that's pretty, pretty much what they say. Like most, I, I would recommend, I would suggest, sorry, that most mainstream media article commentators haven't read through this and they don't uh, they've not read through each and every one of these articles so yes i agree an attack on one is an attack on everyone all right that that's what they say but then it says 
Um, here we are, guys. And then he said, uh, right, okay, I, I do have to read it all. I do have to read it all, guys, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. Um, and consequently, if consequently they agree that if such an armed attack occurs, each of them in exercise of the rights of the individual or collective self-defense recognized by Article 51 of the um of the Charter of the United Nations. Now that Article 51 of the United Na Charter of the United Nations, there, guys, that just goes on and says that um each nation is under, you know, has the right to defend itself. Each nation has the right to form an uh, you know, to form bilateral security agreements with their neighbors. You know, I can do another video on that if you want, guys. So each um, we will assist the party or parties so attacked by taking forth with individual and concert with the other parties such actions. And here's the thing, guys, such actions as deemed necessary. So what does that mean? It doesn't say under there that, you know, we're going to have a full, you know, we're going to go to full out war with Russia if Russia attacked Poland. No, it doesn't say that anyway. It just says we'll take whatever actions we deem necessary including the use of armed force to restore and here's the thing to restore and maintain the security of the north atlantic area so in this instance guys and i'll give you the example now that if putin takes out a load of airfields in poland where here guys does it say that nato are going to strike putin back it doesn't it says we will do we'll take whatever action necessary to restore and maintain the security so if the missile attacks already happened, so put this in the scenario, guys, okay? Putin starts saying that F-16s have been flown from Poland or Romania, which I may think he which I think he may do it, you know, in the coming weeks. So Putin comes out and he makes an announcement. Right, guys, listen, the Ukrainians are flying. And guys, I've said this months ago that this would happen. Um, Putin comes out and he says, Hey guys, the Ukrainians are flying F-16s from Poland from this base in Poland and this base in Romania. This is happening. Okay. The next day, he uses one of these um, these new missile systems, Orshnik, to take out those two mis uh, Air Force bases. There's no more, more attack. Putin comes out and he says, look, there's going to be no more attacks if you don't, you know, if unless you keep flying from those locations. And th that's it. Now it's over. Under this, under this legislation or this memorandum, sorry, what can NATO do? What what strength is there in Article 5? Because there's already security in that location. There's already, there is no more, there is no ongoing fighting. So what can the Security Council do? Any such armed attack, hang on guys. Any such armed attack and all measures taken as a result, therefore, shall immediately be reported to the Security Council. Okay, so we're going to tell mum and dad. Such measures shall be terminated when, <coughs> when the Security Council has taken the measures necessary to restore and maintain international peace and security. Again, if in the scenario I just gave you, Putin declares that the Ukrainians are flying um, F-16s from Polish or Romanian airfields and they're using the scalp missiles to strike targets in Russia. Again, under the, under their own under their own under this, if Putin turns this against NATO and says, "Look, you guys under Article Fifty One of the Charter of the United Nations have the right to self defense," so you see, it becomes uh, it becomes a, a it becomes legal interpretation of what this document actually means. Now, Putin can argue, "Look, you know what, guys, you guys have the right to defend yourself." I'm getting, a, uh, Russians are getting attacked from aircraft that are flying from Polish air bases or Romanian air bases. I have the right to defend myself. So under, and again, I know that it doesn't really matter to Russia, but he could use, he could use, he could actually use this against, you know, against, against NATO. And, you know, it, it, and I, I just thought, I just wanted to read this to you guys. And I just wanted to share this. I do apologize if that was a little bit long winded or a little bit, you know, out of context, but a lot of people think that NATO and NATO Article 5 is some sort of protection, you know, so the next time you hear these like mainstream media commentators and, you know, and people come on the news saying, yes, this would be an Article 5, this would be, if Putin attacked Poland, that would be an Article 5 issue. 
Okay, what what does it actually say in Article 5? Guys, I've just been through Article 5 with you. There's no security in Article 5. Um, you know, there's no security, you know, there's no security in there at all. Um, the battlefield's changed, warfare's changed, you know, and under no circumstances do I feel that if Putin if Putin took out airfields in Poland, in Romania, because he claimed, and remember, it doesn't really matter where these aircraft are being flown from there or not, the perception matters. So if Putin pumps out enough media saying that they are, the Ukrainian F-16s are being flown from these bases, then it doesn't really matter because there'll be that much, mer the, the water will be that murked, nobody will really care. Um, but, you know, that is where we are at the moment, guys. So Article 5 isn't really a protection. The likelihood is that Putin will use more of these into um, it, into whatever they're called this oceanic missile. Like it's a it is whatever it is the, the medium range ballistic missile, whatever it's called, whatever they're calling it, the oceanic. Um, the situation in Ukraine, the front line doesn't exist anymore. Boots on the ground really are an inevitability at this time, guys. You know that is the only way to stop Putin moving up to moving up to Poland, moving up to the River Dnipro at the very minimum, guys. Anyway, I've waffled on for far too long. Thanks for staying with me. If you did, um, I'm going to mag to grid, and I'll get you guys another video later.